Uh, good evening, my name is Nick Schwaderer, and I'm here to speak to you about measuring chronic pain outcomes with Ruby and Twilio. But before I get started, and I don't have everyone on this, I'd like to say thank you uh, to NHS Digital for getting me down here for epigenesis with the, if I said that right, uh, with regard to the nice sustenance and, and the support. Uh, of course, Sheffield Ruby for putting all this together and uh, Trey Castle as well and Pusher and, and all of you for coming down tonight. Thank you for being here and supporting us and uh, having me talk. Um, to start out with the order of the day, what I'm gonna cover for you is first I'm gonna lay out a non-business problem. So this is something encountered not in the line of work. I'm gonna dig into how we attacked the problem, resolved it and analyzed it using Ruby. There's a meat emoji there because that's gonna be the meat of the talk. Hopefully the most interesting bits will be in there. Uh, gonna have a bit of a retrospective and discussion about what we learned, what worked well, and what did not work well. And like I like to do, wrap up, uh, or sorry, look towards the future and wrap up with a nice little moral. So to start, who am I? Uh, I'm Nick. You can tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. I used to live here in Superior, Montana. Uh, is a county about the size of Cornwall, had about 3,000 people in it, and this would be in July. We had a nice chunk of snow up there and everything going to the mountains, so quite outdoorsy. Uh, now, if I still lived there, that would have been a nice little uh, trek. This, uh, this would have been an even bigger deal because I would have gone like 4,000 miles, you know, to, to, to come here and speak. But now I live here in Lost Withiel in Cornwall, which is a lovely little community um, I was saying to some others here, you know, as a nice train stop there, a few pubs uh, within five minutes of my door and restaurants in a, a lovely rural community, not dissimilar to what I was used to growing up, just swap the mountains for the sea. Uh, and by comparison, uh, to me, this is, that's great. That's, that's not bad at all. I mean, I drive farther distances to see friends back in Montana. So, but as I've learned from the locals, they would classify that distance as still a ways. So, <laughs> Depends on who you ask whether I came a ways today or not. I work at Oceans HQ, which is a small company in Cornwall that deals with the vessel registration. I guess the term would be B2B SaaS if you want to be all fancy with it. And we deal with uh, this. So every national government has a, that's a sovereign national government would have a vessel registry. So if you had a pleasure yacht doing international voyages, an oil tanker, a cargo tanker, any of the sh big ships you see on the high seas, they have to be registered and fly the flag of a country. We build the systems that these countries use to do their work. I believe we have about nine or 10 uh, governments together uh, currently using it, always looking to grow more. But that's got nothing to do with what I have to talk about today. So if you wanna talk about procuring to national governments or shipping or piracy law or any of those fun things, happily have a beer after and go into that in depth with you. But what I'm going to talk about today is a story that's personal to me and my fiance, uh, Laura Ward. So I'll take me into part one, which is the problem. And I'll take all of us back to summer 2017, really going back into the winter at the end of 2016. Laura started experiencing hip pain. Now we all get pains from time to time. Maybe you twist an elbow or a shoulder and you have a few months where you just kind of groan about it. But for her, it got worse and worse. So she went to physio or physical therapy, as we'd say back home. And she did everything that she was told. She was very good. And it didn't, it didn't improve. She's, she's the toughest person I know, but she knew it wasn't getting any better. Then she kept seeing the doctors and she was led to an X-ray, which led to an MRI, which had us in a surgeon's office where she was given a diagnosis of having a vascular necrosis in the hip. Now, vascular necrosis is where there's insufficient blood supply to uh, bone tissue, typically in joints like the hip or the shoulder, and that bone dies. And of course, as that bone dies and you're walking on that hip every single day, it becomes quite painful and it starts to crumble and it starts to collapse. So she has a tremendous amount of pain and was told that for her, the only option was a total hip replacement. Now, this is quite rare for someone in their 20s. Uh, when we went in for her hip replacement, there were people were quite surprised to see her. You normally hear about hip replacements, slightly older members of the community. Um, and normally, you know, when trying to figure out what caused this, uh, the, the, the steroid, steroid interactions, but she wasn't taking steroids, 
or like cirrhosis inducing alcoholism or, just se or severe drinking. And she is Irish and we do like a drink, but uh, we never, and by the way, this will not be resolved. We have no idea uh, why this was so unfortunate, but this is about how we dealt with the situation. So when we were talking with the surgeon, now think of this from my perspective. You know, I'm, I see myself this American vision of a man, of a protector, of trying to look after, not just be emotional support, but to, I wanna fight whatever's harming the person I love, right? And I'm just, I'm just thinking of what I can do. And then the surgeon in passing said, because we were gonna have to wait another three to four months for the surgery. As you're dealing with this pain, I've been doing this for 20 years, just so you know, Barometric pressure movements I have seen to impact people's pain in their joints. And that just keep an eye on it and you might be able to know a bit better when your pain is gonna be worse based on the pressure swings. And some of you may have heard, you know, I remember as a kid hearing old timers say, oh, it's the weather and grabbing their knee. But I never really thought much of this until the surgeon said it. And it got me to thinking just A to B to C Pain itself was nearly unpredictable in this chronic pain situation. Uh, Laura might do everything she's supposed to do. She might behave well and not push herself and be very, very good. And we go out and she's in acute, horrible pain. And she's a lot tougher than me. Or she might push it a little bit and actually have quite a good day. And that was an issue because you know, say we're in Cornwall, maybe we want to go to a gin festival, maybe we want to go to the beach or see our friends. Do something besides being in the house and you're rolling the dice every time, trying to make plans and just live a normal life with this situation. However, I knew that pressure systems were very predictable. You know, there's a little bit of a waiver here and there, but unless it's a hurricane, you can roughly tell what the pressure is going to be like and forecast it. So I knew in that moment that I had the tooling available to test this hypothesis that was supplied to me and potentially, based on those results, forecast it. But that was just in my head at the time. So I sat down and negotiated with Laura. And like I said, she's Northern Irish, so she's, she drives a tough bargain. And when we were done negotiating, what we came out with it is that she would help me track and measure her pain. And in exchange, I would start counting my caloric intake every day. <laughs> And uh, I, I won't talk about the second point again in this talk, but I did lose 15 pounds since the start of this. So I, was, I upheld my end. Uh, this brings me to part two. So we've identified the problem and we've identified the hypothesis. Now to, to working on it together with the aid of Ruby and Twilio. So before you write any code or architect anything, you want to set out a list of goals. Ours were first to identify as many pain readings as possible then marry those pain readings to the barometric pressure at the location and time, and then at the end process the readings to test the hypothesis and for potential forecasting. The setup that we put together had a few components. The first thing that I discovered and may have been influenced by my bias as a primarily back-end developer is that a web UI was out of scope for this application. So we'd have one user in being uh, in and out, being notified, giving readings. We didn't need any authentication. We didn't need to scale to any more users. It was incredibly simple. And any excuse for me to avoid writing CSS or JavaScript, I'm very happy. HTML, anything. So the solution we went for was Twilio and SMS. I heard someone talk about earlier. How many of you have played with Twilio a little bit or even worked with it? OK, so a few. Um, Twilio is a very popular library that uh, you can use with a lot of different languages, including Ruby, to interact with sending and receiving text messages. And I will just give them some kudos right now. It was a very smooth ride working with it. I briefly worked with it, but it it's, uh, supports developers in such a way that you could have never touched anything with sending and receiving text. And just Google for their docs, go on their website, and have a tremendous amount of support for as a Rubyist which there's plenty of libraries that don't offer great Ruby support. So I'm very grateful for them for this. And in fact, it's so good, you might even not be that great at Ruby and be able to use the Ruby docs to use it. Not me though, I'm, I'm great at Ruby. Um, 
And then uh, we hooked in, so we, we need to get our information hooked into Weather Underground. It's been around since I think the mid 90s and has 10 to 20,000 independent weather stations along with a proper weather data set that supply their information. You know, um, you always have those list of things you want to do. I've always wanted to set up my independent weather station in my house as well and supply information to them uh, to get our barometric pressure readings. This is the gem that I used at the time. I actually went for the more official one. Somehow this gem let me get around using an API key and just straight up getting the information, whereas the proper one required, so I didn't ask any questions on how that worked. Um, I could have, there's danger there, but, um, and then just to take a little detour here on barometric pressure measurement. Now any developer will tell you, whatever unit of measure you use doesn't matter as long as you're consistent and keep to it. But I had some options here and it was my choice. So what I had to pick from, the SI unit of measuring pressure is kilopascals, which is a Newton per square meter. And what I like to think of as the baseline, and, and it's used a lot, is what's the average pressure at sea level globally, right? In this case, it'd be about 101 kilopascals. If God put the USA in there, it'd be 15 pounds per square inch. Uh, you may only see PSI if you put air in your tire. Uh, and actually, being from America, I don't even remember this getting used in context for the atmosphere either. Uh, the one that was supplied to me by Weather Underground was inches of mercury. So unless you were working in the space, I don't think you would have heard of inches of mercury unless it's from a grandparent or something. Um, but that was just a scale with mercury that would be a certain number of inches up based on that scale. Uh, millibars, which, fun fact, not an SI recognized unit, but it is metric. Uh, so you have one bar, and the average pressure is about 10, 13.25 millibars, and of course, an atmosphere, which is the atmosphere of whatever planet you're on at the time, um, and, and it, it bases that on one. So it's very close to millibars. I went with millibars for two reasons. One, the swing of the pressure we were dealing with was between 980 millibars and 1020 millibars, so mentally it was easy to kind of grasp that unit. Also in shipping, they like to use millibars, so I have a slant that way, so I went with that. As far as uh, our objects, it's about, it can't get any more simple than this, right? We've got our primary key, timestamps, and all we care about is the pressure and the pain level. That, that's it. Dead easy, right? It doesn't get any easier than that. But there are some things that were hard. And the hard thing is you won't be surprised dealing with the users. So, you know, in, in your work, you, you think about the users and you are a user focused, you know, uh, entity, whatever, wherever you work, but, you know, there may be some abstraction. Like you may not get the phone calls from the users. You might get past the emails from grumpy users. You aren't there in the room while they're struggling with the app unless you're doing maybe some QA or something. However, in this case, if the user is one and the user is the person that you live with and are going to live with for the rest of your life and love and spend a lot of time with, if they're having a poor experience with your application, you're gonna be having a bad day as well. So this was the most important part and it was the most difficult part because I got instant feedback on every time I messed up. So here's the core flow that I brought together for our user. They'd receive five random messages a day between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. And we would adjust that for if we had to sleep in or get up early. And then there'd be a pain reading captured during the response. Again, married to the barometric pressure. And then after it's deployed, handle all the edge cases you can and try and survive. The first one that I had to deal with was unexpected user inputs. So with SMS, I, I ditched the front end, uh, the traditional web UI front end. So I can't force her into sending me an integer. I can try and respond and say, maybe you should send me an integer. But she's got basically this text area, really, limitless amount of text that she can put in, and I just have on faith that she's gonna be a good user. So if she were to send something unexpected, <laughs> which I sanitized for the talk, it comes in. But now if you know with your handling of this string, which is worse, right? Because if she is um, in a position where something that she's working on with me if she's texting that, what kind of pain day do you think she's having? Nine, eight? She's having the kind of pain like, I don't care about you and your stupid Ruby and your stupid app. I hate you. 
and I'm cussing at you through this thing. And for me, it doesn't break anything. It's the worst, like I wish it would break and not record. So then you get this data input that goes in that's recording a big fat zero when you're having a pressure reading that should be a big fat nine or a 10, right? Luckily, I had a very honest user who confessed on a better day that this, that this came in, so I was able to capture it because that would not have been caught by me. And then once you do that, you do a little bit deeper inspection and just kind of handle it. I sanitized this as well for the talk. Um, but then you have unintentional unexpected user inputs. So we get things like this. So if she were to double tap a number and then send it, but you can't, you can't uh, predict everything with the user, right? So the other side of it is just po data post-processing. With this, we had a small enough data set. You could literally eyeball it, but if you had a few hundred thousand records, a few million records, you could use leverage Ruby then with the post-processing, look for unexpected inputs like that and be able to clean it really with, with no trouble. Then I wanted to encourage user input because we were, we were going through a tough time and this was, luckily, we're focusing on the chronic, but chronic pain. Um, but we, this was gonna be several months of her being reminded about her pain. And I wanted to make it slightly more positive than asking her how her pain was. So just developer, Giphy makes everything better, right? So I put up a Giphy integration just to make it a little less dry. Uh, she liked funny cat and dancing. And I didn't ask her before I did this. I just did it on my own. And uh, hooked up with their API with some keys. And then with it give her a little bit more when it recorded the message back, right? So make it a little more enjoyable for her. And, uh, and, it, and it worked pretty well. But again, we hit another problem longer term. It, that's not always such sensitive to the situation because if you're doing a funny dancing man when she's on a nine, you hear about it instantaneously and get told, delete that, shut it down, I don't want to see that. So what I ended up doing very simply was having a set of messages or types of GIFs that would come through on uh, mid to low tier days and then I'd never send one on a high pain day. And actually I would give her custom messages because this application evolved and it became a way that I interacted with Laura now because I might, she might be at work, I might be at work, but I'm able to have interactions with her. So things that I put in are coming through to her and you, it, does, it runs over, you don't need to see the whole thing. Um, but that way I could do this. And I spent a lot of time actually editing just copy inside of arrays. Uh, and, and, and sending it down to her. And, and so on, on a nicer day, I could just kind of oomph the nice, like, hey, it's a one, that's great. And by the way, it's a useful reading as well. So it's, it's not even in vain, so it's great data. And a little more somber, give her support on the rough days. So I would be able, in a weird way, to in real time send her a slightly more personal note when she was having a hard day. And that's the way we approached it for roughly three months. And we, she was very faithful. We got a good chunk of data with the time that we had. And here's a few things that we learned. This slide I put in at Laura's request. So we learned a lot about how we view pain because it's subjective, right? My two is not your two or your four and my two may change day to day, right? And it's, it's, so it's incredibly subjective. That's why we wanted to get so many figures to just try and get a signal through the noise because we knew there was gonna be variance. We knew there was gonna be so many external factors, but if we brought it all together, could we see movement one way or the other that would help tilt the, the needle and the pain based on certain weather inputs? And when she was having her hip replacement, when she was out in recovery, she was asked what her pain level was. And, they, and there's no, uh, baseline established. They had no idea what her four, five, six, or seven was. And Laura was incredibly conservative with her numbers. A one for her was about the level where before this talk, I would have been sat there and turned to you and said, sorry, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain or I'm in pain enough that you would tell someone that you just met that you're in pain. That was a one for her, right? But most people just out of surgery, just fly up the scale because they're not used to tracking and measuring and benchmarking their pain every single day. So Laura would be sat there and holding my hand in tears and give a six. And there were certain drugs that they would not give unless they did a seven or above, so they objectified a subjective scale. So the way that we ended up dealing with that is she had to tweak her numbers to them and just give them what they wanted to hear to get the numbers. 
I don't know how you solve that. Maybe uh, I did have someone come up to me after hearing about this and say that with their work in, I think it is in the Midlands, that they do establish baselines before they get other numbers so they know if it's moving one way or the other. Another thing that we learned is it'd be very useful in future to make things mobile. So we didn't move a lot. We were in the house and then one week we were in Belfast. So I actually just kept things simple and hard coded the values. But I wouldn't be able to get these values dynamically and I didn't want to build a full mobile application. So this would definitely benefit from location gathering, which I'll talk a little bit more in a moment. But this brings me to another question on how do we best process this information? So this is, we're all done. Laura's recovering. I take out the laptop. Let's see what we can learn here. So first, dump the information into a two-dimensional array and then wrote it to a CSV so I could share it with non-Rubius, non-programmers who could eyeball it and interact. Um, all with Laura participating. I didn't just steal her data and start sharing it privately with the whole world. You know, I mean, GDPR's got nothing on the amount of uh, stuff we've got around this data. Uh, visualize it with a graph, and as you can see here, um, since we used single integers, uh, there's, it's quite a step, right, in between. And uh, one thing that Laura did say if, for doing it again is she didn't think that it was worth going another uh, set of 10 down. So she didn't think 2.3, 2.4 is too much resolution, but she did think that half, half a step, so 2.5, 3.5, because let's say you're feeling, you, you get pinged at lunchtime, you're like, I'm a bit worse than this morning, which was a three, but I'm not as bad as last night, which is a four, right? So get a 3.5, a little more resolution in there. But for someone casually doing it all the time, doing uh, 100 values might be a little too uh, dense. And then I put together a support vector machine, which is a supervised uh, learning algorithm that takes in a set of training data of varying types and makes predictions with methodologies that you could do a 45 minute talk on all by itself. Uh, but I want to give a shout out to practicalai.com. Uh, does anyone been to that website? Ever heard of it? So it's uh, some individuals who put together a series of blog posts linked to GitHub repos exclusively in Ruby, going through various different machine learning approaches because I'd never done any of it. And I was actually able to use their example code with real data. You can run it right in your machine, pull the repo, run it, and, and get that, and be able to do it. And I'll be using it more in the future um, for, for other projects. Because if you've never done it, these heavy blog posts are hard for me to parse, right? But actually giving me a repo with data, it's like, I know what that is. I know how to use that. And then outputs, and then I can start plugging in my data and fiddling with it and tweaking it to my needs. I learn by doing. That's the best way for me to learn. And that helped. So if there's any questions at the end about like the intricacies of a support vector machine in that choice, I'm afraid I will let you down, but uh, that's it. That's, I want to give them props. The user, uh, Dalgard, or if I have any Scandinavian friends here, they probably would say how oh, I should say that. Um, and there's example SVM. That's exclusively what I used uh, is the inspiration for this processing. So you'd bring in your set of training data, and you'd run that in to the SVM. Then you'd have a set of testing data that you'd run that against to see how accurate it was. And for me, I'd run it a few times, randomizing the values, shuffling this nested array. Now, the one other thing with an SVM that you have to work on is finding the best C and gamma values. In short, there are two parameters that can be adjusted. Um, a larger C will give you lower bias and higher variance, and uh, a low C will give you high bias and low variance, and a gamma defines how far a single training example will have influence. And the way that they approach this with finding that is dividing it into a third set, right? So you'd have the training data set, you'd have the finding the best C and gamma value set, and then you'd have the testing. So of course, it, you need a bit more data, um, but it would literally, you know, think about your code complexity here, but whatever. Um, it would iterate through the likely values you could use on your C and your gamma, check the accuracy against the trained data set, and then give you the, the figures that are gonna work best for that that you can apply. So pre-results disclaimer here, folks. Whatever I say about how these, this data worked, this was already a win for Laura and myself. It took a time where it could have been tough it out, watch Netflix, have some wine, love each other, try and survive this, and it, instead it gave us something where we could have action 
and we could participate together and kind of try and, and learn and get something out of this. It took where Laura would come up to me like, oh, I had an eight today. Did, what was the pressure? What was the pressure? I had an eight today. You know, where it was a bit more like in control. Whereas if you've ever had pain for an amount of time or currently do, it is kind of a removal of control, which is, is dehumanizing. And it also gave us the hope that maybe there could be something from this that help others. But even if it didn't go well, that this was a, a win. So round one, we had a test generalization accuracy of 24.43% running this, which is not good in my opinion. It's not as bad as random, but it's not good. And I was quite gutted. And I kind of chucked the laptop away for a few weeks after that happened. And then one day, as I was thinking about maybe talking to people about this a few months ago, I, I got everything back out and I looked again, okay, how did I run those numbers? And I thought, what if I cared more about close than exact, right? So if the weatherman told you that there'd be 2.5 inches of rain tomorrow at three and there's 2.2 inches of rain, would you say that was a failure? I'd, no, I'd say there was rain and there's a certain amount of rain as opposed to no rain. And if you said it was gonna be 18 degrees or 25 degrees tomorrow and it was 26.5, and that's how I was measuring it. If it wasn't dead on, I was checking it out as a, as a failure. So what if it was within one? You know, what if it got you, it, told, it gave you an eight, but you're actually a seven, or two, but you're actually a three? So within one, we actually jumped to 60.34%, which, which got us excited. Just because I had to do it, I also checked within two, um, which I wouldn't do in the field, because that's quite a wide range, but I wanted to see if it kept stepping up and we just about crested 90% with that. And one more takeaway, again, you can use Ruby all day, but a good eyeball of the data also helps doing the work. Um, if you look here, there's a gap in the corner, and we got, I don't know, uh, 20, 30 odd readings above about 10, 19 millibars. And in all those readings, you see Laura gave threes, twos, and ones all the way throughout, they existed. There was at least some representation of a three and a two and a one in there. Even if it was more or less dense, we can process that, but it was numbers that she was reporting as a user. However, above that, she never gave one. Not on a fluke, not on a hitting the wrong button, not on a secretly really good day with her hip. She never went three, two, or one, or, or under four, above 10, 19 millibars. So that was uh, something that we combined. So with our data conclusion, that, between that second part and that last part, it gave us the validation to proceed wider and conduct further study and improve the application. Um, looking to publish data for analysis eventually as well and get involved in collecting more data. So let's talk about the future. So this is getting rebuilt right now uh, by myself with the help of a few friends. Um, I have been approached with uh, at least one person who's interested in putting in more data on a long-term basis. So we have an open source build at uh, GitHub, Schwad, that's me, um, and then we've, we've called it Mara. And we're moving away from Twilio now to Telegram. So Telegram has an API for their bots. I don't know if you've ever interacted with a Telegram bot. It's actually a really interesting bot first process. To register your bot, you message one of their bots and interact with the bot to get the bot. So it's bot-only interface. So it's kind of going from the aesthetic of an SMS-only interface to bot-only interface. And we're trying to avoid the web element as much as we can and just keep everything in, in the bot world. Um, we are using the uh, Telegram bot gem from a lovely Rubyist whose handle is El Jojo, who was at the last conference that I met. And we're putting that together. And one of the best things with Telegram, as well as not having to pay for texts, because um, that adds up, is location sharing. So you can now, as of two to three years ago, share your location with a Telegram bot. That solves our problem out of the box. So with their API, we can have that interaction, we can have it for free, we can have it globally, and we can also have a live location and check how relevant their location is and marry that live to the data and not have to worry about that. That was the biggest hurdle, because I don't want to have to hard code a coordinate ever again I want users to be able to freely do it. And what I do like about Telegram, some people may find it annoying, but it's not a lifelong share. You have to authorize shares for periods of time. 
And, I, and, and that's good, because I don't want to be the person who knows where you are all the time if you don't want to know. Um, and other things that we're going to be putting in is the automation of the processing. So I had this whole chunk of my talk where I talked to you about how I got my laptop open and I figured out these ways and I was running those numbers. Encapsulate that up within the application and automate it and run it nightly. That way we can see with users, how is our accuracy doing? And graph it and, and keep a score and keep a number. So maybe run it a series of times, take the mean and the outlier values and just see over time how we're doing with processing. And also run it against multiple permutations. Uh, the last time some individuals heard about this, they came up to me and said, Nick, I know about the pressure, but have you thought about the temperature? I swear to you that my pain situation is incredibly impacted by cold temperature. And there was a lot, and they said maybe it was going with the pressure as well, I'm not sure. So what we can do very easily with this, we're just storing more uh, data. So as first class citizens, we're still gonna store barometric pressure and now temperature and a few others, but also we're gonna capture the entire weather profile every time it comes in. So for future processing, it's open source. Say someone in this room said, you know what, I think these five things together would be important. But we'll run those permutations. Um, and, and it might actually lead to showing us which combination is, is the best one. And we can also have those uh, permutations on different tactics, neural network as opposed to SVM, run them against each other and see which gives us the best information. And also checking there's different types of chronic pain and running this against those and seeing if ones are more weather impacted than others. Um, is it individual focus predictions or group-based predictions as well? And every time I've talked about this, there was a point where somebody said, all right, well, what do you want to do, do with this then? What's your ultimate goal? If everything, let's say it works well. Let's say you get the data and you end up finding the right permutation of factors on the right type of chronic pain that gives you, say, 95% within one or 90, 98% on one. What are you going to do with it? What's the point? And for me, if I was given that really fortunate situation, I wouldn't go all out forecasting. I think it's still a bit bold to tell someone what their pain is going to be all day and night. I think it just felt a little cold to me. But what could we give feedback on? And I think if you had a certain amount of confidence in a weather forecast that, say, a Thursday, three days ahead, was going to meet all the criteria on which they'd always had an 8, 9, or a 10 day, then you give them a warning. So you aren't intruding into this person's life and telling them how they're going to feel every day, but you can give them a heads up, kind of like an icy road warning. Just saying, hey, you might be fine, but if you're making plans, just to let you know, Thursday might be really uniquely bad for you. Um, I'm not, I, I wouldn't go to say good either because I think it's a letdown if it wasn't good then, but at least giving them a little more control because then for Laura and I, it, was, it wasn't so much the pain, it was the unknown. It was, I have no idea if Thursday is going to be rotten. Uh, and if we could eventually someday provide that, uh, that, that for me would be the goal. But again, it's open source, so uh, anybody's feedback as well would be welcome on that. Which brings me to the moral here. So working with Ruby and Rails or whatever tech stack you use, it's not a binary choice. You're not either working for the man or working on toy apps. And I don't really like the term toy app for that reason. Some of the most important things we do aren't necessarily in our day job. Not everyone can do what we do. Like there's a lot of people who can visualize like we visualize, like I want to do A that leads to B that leads to C, but they don't have the tools and muscle memory to be able to put all the pieces together to make this happen. Even though this was very simple, right? The, I mean, there's no crazy data model. There's no Redis or AWS or, or, or anything. It's very simple, uh, but not everyone would be able to spin things up like that. And what could be a few minutes of mindless, you know, kind of trundling along scripting for you could be life changing for somebody else. And from a selfish perspective, it lets you experience new tooling and experiences. I got to work with Twilio more than I ever have. I'm getting to work with uh, Telegram bot and Telegram API more than I ever have. And I actually have literally talked to a group of people about something to do with machine learning, which I'd never touched within 100 miles of that before. So from that selfish perspective, it's a great way to deploy these little things there on your queue of, I want to try this tooling out. So kind of wrapping up, I gave you a story that had nothing to do with my job. I walked through 
approaching the problem that came out of that story, I did a bit of a retrospective, looking back on what we learned and where we've come. And I hope, hopefully, the newest part, giving a look at the future, which I think is very exciting, uh, really building on that every day. So there's always something changing with that. Um, and then kind of just tried to impart on you just generically, not really even promoting this project, but promoting the idea that we have, a, I call it the Ruby superpower, and that it's quite a positive, neat thing that we have. So thank you so much for having me here today, and I really appreciate uh, the chance to talk to you, so thanks.